Car Doctor of Washington, Iowa. No matter who Frankenstein it, they can fix and clean and customize it. Griner Auto Body of Washington, Iowa, using state-of-the-art techniques and decades of experience to get your car back on the road after an accident. McDonald Boneyard of Kyoto, Iowa, for all of your farm equipment and auto recycling needs. Girling Repair of Winfield, Iowa. If your mower is dead, call Fred, your Husqvarna, Aaron's, and Gravely dealer, and he fixes snow blowers too. Winter's coming, folks. Hinshaw Trailer Sales of Richland, Iowa. You need a trailer, they've got your trailer, and they fix what they sell and don't in their full-time repair shop. B&B Propane and the family of Jet Stops present Southeast Iowa Today. I'm John Bain, author of Christie's Journey, The Beat Goes On, and your host. On this episode, I'm heading to Crawfordsville, Iowa, to the ISU Research Farm. That's the Iowa State University Research Farm. And I'm visiting with Farm Superintendent Cody Schneider. And we cover a lot of things, and it's amazing what goes on. I think you're going to really like this episode. Cody, welcome to Southeast Iowa today. And um, it, it's uh, really exciting for me to be here. And where exactly is here? Yeah, so we're uh, uh, standing in our new uh, research and learning center, uh, just recently built uh, in Crawfordsville, Iowa. And it is something, I'll tell you folks, this is uh, quite a nice facility. I'm gonna just kind of show you around a little bit here. It's big. It's huge, and it has to be, obviously, to get equipment like this in here. And you're farm superintendent here at the Iowa State Research Center and Extension Research, did I say that right? ISU, Extension. ISU Southeast Research Farm. There you go. How did you become farm superintendent? Yeah, so um, went on to college and studied uh, agronomy at Iowa State University. I. Um, graduated with a, a degree in agronomy, uh, worked for in the seed corn production industry for uh, about five years. Um, the opportunity came up uh, for the ag specialist position here uh, and I, I, I jumped on that and uh, as I put my time in the opportunity arose to, to become the, the farm manager or farm superintendent and, and uh, you know it's just it's kind of a dream job and, and uh, you get uh, you get a almost farm every day, but you know, you got a monthly paycheck coming to you. So um, kind of takes really a little enjoyable. bit of the gamble out of it. Doesn't oh yeah, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, of course you get to work with a lot of great people within Extension and Iowa State University. And um, you know, you get to be on the leading edge of, of, of the research that comes out of Iowa State University. So. Now, how many people actually work here at the research farm in Crawfordsville? Yeah, so uh, we manage the farm here, the Southeast Research Farm, which is 273 acres. Uh, we also uh, manage the uh, research farm in Fruitland, Iowa, uh, which is about 125 acres. And between the two farms, uh, there's four of us full-time staff. And then usually we'll have a summer intern as well. So you folks go back and forth between here and Fruitland then? Yes. Uh, obviously, this is a working farm and it's uh, 12 months out of the year. Uh, we're just, today is October 31st, so ha if someone hasn't heard it yet, happy Halloween. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, you know, there's so much that goes on all year long. I wish I could have been here for some of the harvest. I understand there still is a field that, to be harvest, so we'll yeah. probably, a couple of them will be able to see yeah, that. Yeah, go check that out here in a little bit. Awesome. So what, what are you thinking about doing it, you know, at the end of October, first part of November of 2023? What, what's, what's going on next? Yeah, so just like any farmer, we're thinking about next year already and, and uh, what projects we're going to have at the farm and where they're going to be placed at the farm, what kind of fertilizer requirements that's going to have, what kind of fall setup, maybe that's tillage, maybe that's uh, cover crop seeding, um, uh, anything, any kind of fall management that we need to be getting done now. Uh, to just prepare us for the 2024 season. Got you. Now, what's what's your favorite time of the year? 
Oh, it's gotta be harvest. <laughs> you get the combine out, you get to see, you know, reap the, or you get to see what uh, you, basically you've sown all year and all that hard work that you put in and you, you get the, you're collecting that data and you get that off to the researchers and anytime you get some good findings, it just, it, that's a lot of fun. And are you finding good things? Oh, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether you're seeing a statistical difference in the treatments or not, it's, it's giving you good information, whether there was a true treatment effect or, or, or whether there is no treatment effect. And, you know, when, when you ask that question, uh, you know, we've got some fungicide trials this year that, uh, you know, we didn't really have a whole lot of disease. And so we didn't see uh, a lot of, uh, or much of a yield response to those fungicide applications, but that's still kind of, that's still giving us good information. Um, kind of like with the tillage and, uh, uh, those kind of studies, you know, you're getting a lot of good information whether you're seeing a treatment effect or not. Maybe, you know, you're looking at the no-till aspect of it. Um, if you're seeing no treatment effect, that, that's kind of a good thing. Now, with the drought this year, have you, did you notice a difference in yields? Yeah, um, so basically we record rainfall from, uh, for the growing season basically manually, and then we also have an automated weather station. And um, basically from March, till not to, or from March 1 to the end of October today, we're, we're uh, collecting that rainfall data. And the last I checked, we were right around 10 inches behind average. Um, fortunately, uh, throughout the growing season, well, to start the growing season, we had a full soil mo moisture profile. And, um, you know, we started out the season good and a couple timely rains, we still was able to see some pretty, pretty favorable yields. Now, obviously uh, the world depends on Iowa farmers and farmers across the United States and across the world we've got farmers. Now, because of the research that uh, is done in far, like at farms here and such, because we're 10 inches down, the, the technologies and the uh, advancements that come from the research farms help to, uh, to combat those droughts. Yeah, there's, uh, um, you know, from the research that, that we've conducted here, we've helped uh, uh, promote different uh, agricultural practices that can help uh, um, make our uh, crop or crops more resilient to well, those conditions. Well, thank, thank God that uh, there's folks like you and folks like the folks that you work with and the farmers here in Iowa and the United States and across the world because uh, you guys keep us all going and I thank you for that. Yeah, well, you bet, thank you. Well, we're going to wrap up this segment and uh, check out some other areas. I needed a break in between two interview segments, and I thought this would be a good time to thank you for watching the podcast. If you're watching on Spotify, please follow us there. If you're watching on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on a thing. Now, back to the program. Cody... Tell us how the Iowa State Extension, I should say Iowa State University Extension Research Farm came into existence, how it's operated, and uh, where you're at today. Yeah, so basically um, uh, we had local farmers and agribusinessmen uh, that just saw a need for, to have that uh, site-specific uh, research done in southeast Iowa. There wasn't a farm in this area to, to kind of represent the soils and, and weather uh, that, that we see in southeast Iowa as you compare it to other parts of Iowa. And those um, farmers and agribusiness uh, businesses got together and, and formed the Southeast Iowa Agricultural Research Association. And basically that makes up 21 counties in southeast Iowa. Um, and basically anybody can be a member of the association. Each county has a board member uh, that's elected. And basically the association um, uh, raised the funds uh, with, from local farmers and agribusinesses to, to purchase the land. And that, that fundraising actually came in the early 80s. And if you think about the early 80s, kind of the tough farming. Yeah, uh, uh, a lot of farms were being auctioned yeah, off. Yeah, just the, the, the farm economy was pretty tough. And, and that just goes to show how important those uh, members felt to have uh, a research farm in Southeast Iowa. And uh, I believe it was in 1987, they purchased the first track of land, uh, just shy of 200 acres uh, here in Washington County and uh, in, in Crawfordsville, Iowa, and uh, um, basically started the research farm. So 
uh, between the association uh, members and the board members. Uh, there's a memorandum of understanding to work with Iowa State University to conduct that research. And basically, uh, um, you know, the projects can be determined by the local people here and what needs they see and, and, and what kind of projects they'd like to have here. And then also with Iowa State University researchers to, to uh, co-manage the farm. And Iowa State University, located in Ames, uh, has extension offices around the whole state, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so, yeah, so and those, those are key because we conduct the research here. The researchers, they'll uh, look at the data and, and give us the conclusions, and those uh, ag special, or those specialists at the, those extension offices are, are what put on uh, the different meetings to, to disseminate that information that we, we've gathered here. And this ISU just has a very close relationship with so many farmers across the state. It's just incredible. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And, and yeah, so uh, we put on, actually, you know, since this new building here, we've actually hosted uh, 23 different events here at the research farm, uh, both uh, uh, public and private events. And uh, some of those are our, our annual spring and fall field days where uh, we're able to go out in the field, look at the different uh, research projects and talk about some of the findings. And, and we also do demonstration projects as well, where, you know, maybe the, the research wasn't done right here, but we were able to at least kind of demonstrate what the findings was from that that project um, and with with those annual um, spring and fall field days and our, our annual meeting um, you know with this great new building here we are also have been able to start uh, hosting what we call planter university um, in February basically we'll have our next one coming up and uh, we bring in some uh, new planter units and talk about some of the new technology that's on those planters they I mean it's night and day difference uh, within the last 10 years even and in, in the technology that is on these planters now so. I can only imagine and and when you bring in those folks those are men and women that are in the ag business yep but you also have students that come in yeah exactly so um we uh also host uh our uh, annually a uh, youth ag exploration field day here uh it's actually a two-day event uh brings in 310 uh or this last year it brought in 310 uh, uh different or 310 students and uh wow. Um, from 21 different schools throughout Southeast Iowa. So basically we invite every high school student throughout that within the association's uh, footprint of 21 counties. And we bring those students in to, to um, give them the opportunity to learn about, you know, what, what, what career opportunities are there in agriculture? Because, you know, today's day and age, not everybody's growing up on a farm, but there is a ton of agriculture uh, careers and some great careers that you, you might not otherwise be aware of if you if they didn't have that opportunity. When you think about it, uh, farming and the ag business is kind of like uh, building cars. There's so many offshoot businesses that go along with it once a car is built. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the same thing with agriculture. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, even you know, you, a lot of times you think agriculture, you think plant and seed growing across, but there's so much technology in it now. You, I mean, it, it's the engineering, the computer science side of it. I mean, there's just a lot of opportunities in agriculture that, that you wouldn't necessarily think of. Now, we've, we've had a pretty neat conversation and I'm sure there's a question that I didn't ask that may, you may have an answer to. Uh, is there something that I should have asked you that I haven't? Yeah, I mean, if we could, there's so much that goes on at the farm, it's hard to, to pinpoint one thing. And I mean, we could, we could uh, make this a daily podcast to <laughs> yeah. talk about all the different projects that we have going on here. I would just maybe mention a few farm uh, stats that we have. Generally, the Southeast Research Farm here, we've been having around uh, uh, 47 research projects annually, and that's with uh, 35 different uh, uh, project leaders. I would, I usually say that's around 90% ISU uh, uh, led researchers, but we do have you know, the remaining 10% comes from private industry uh, uh, um, businesses that, that have some sort of product or, or that they want to have um, compared. So, well, it's just amazing this place. Where are we going to go to next? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Should we get in the truck and look around? Yeah, you bet. Let's take a little tour. All right. So, Cody, we're in this nice warm truck. Where are we heading and where are we at right now? Yeah, uh, so we're just kind of going out into the actual fields where um, uh, 
some of the studies that are taking place. Um, you know, we got the nice little headquarters up there and we're not mm -hmm. too far from it, but I right. tell you what, with today's wind, I'm sure glad uh, we got a truck to drive around in. So. I am too. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, um, kind of one of our longer term studies here, you can see a couple smaller uh, uh, fields where we've been looking at uh, uh, some cover crop and tillage uh, treatments. Um, now, explain to folks that may not know what is the importance of cover crop and what exactly is the crop yeah you know that you so our main crops on this project was corn and beans and uh basically the corn and beans you're growing them from april to um you know october and and then the the, the field is barren after that there's kind of a brown period and so um that, that cover crop gets drilled right after, or it could be drilled right after the crop has been harvested, or it could be spread by a plane or, or a helicopter to, to basically get something green growing out there for that, that brown period that our, our cash crop is not growing. And what is, what is it usually that is, is put out, out there? Yeah, so the, the cover crop that we have chosen for this project uh, is cereal rye. Okay. Um, and that grows fast, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it, it you know it, it doesn't take much to get it established in the fall, and it, it'll give you some good cover, especially in the spring when um, you know we generally would have a lot more rain. Gotcha, gotcha. What's some of the other uh, um, <clears throat> other than rye is used in fields? Um, there's there's many different options that can be used, but some of the other ones that that i'm aware of would be like your your oats in the fall mm -hmm. um you know that'll winter kill so you don't have to worry about uh, uh um, terminating in the spring gotcha. uh, some folks will use turnips kind of have the same concept as well um and, and i mean there's you know there's a wide variety of options something that that can you know be established in the fall and and uh give you a little bit of cover i see and so we're actually coming up now on uh one of our our larger strip trials that uh, was brought to us uh this spring and um basically it was a, a wheat study looking at um you know two different varieties of wheat and then also um you know comparing um uh, soybean yields for a uh, normal soybean planting versus uh, soybeans planted into the green uh, wheat growing in the spring as an intercrop and then what you still see out there right now is our uh, double crop bean treatment where basically we harvested the wheat and then planted the beans and we're trying to see if we can gain any kind of uh, yield um, or have any kind of yield gain by planting that soybean um, into the wheat and having it already growing before the wheat's even harvested. Now who decides that that's something you should do is that somebody yeah. at the university or so uh the university brings us projects uh private industry brings us projects and then also you know our our, our board members for the association uh can bring us projects and this is something that that uh you know it's there's been an interest by the board there's been an interest in the local farmers there's, that have been trying it as well and then uh um you know we we had a, a local agribusinesses that was willing to partner with us to to give us the seed and, and stuff to make it. So then they uh, they put together uh, the plan and you guys implement. Yeah, it. yeah. They they uh, I mean it, it kind of joint effort on this one. Uh, okay. Um, coming up with the the complete protocol because there's a lot going on in this one. This this is a little bit different than your traditional research projects. Because this was more of a systems approach. You know, generally you are looking at specific treatments where everything is other than those treatments are exactly the same. But here we made some changes on planting population and, and, and how we plant it. Like we, um, you know, 30 inch rows, there's 15 inch rows um, as well. So Very good. Uh, to try to look at it from a systems approach. Well, it seems to be working. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this, uh, cornfield off to the, my left here uh -huh. it's kind of uh, an interesting study as well basically one of the treatments on that field was uh, um, a parasitic nematode that basically will uh that, that um will parasitize uh, uh corn Paras rootworms Par i'm saying that right. i mean, say <laughs> parasitic nematode didn't he play for the dodgers yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, it's kind of an interesting study. Uh, it, it's fairly new, so not really a whole lot of data that can be shared from it, but just something uh, completely different that, than your traditional um, projects that we've had here. So, it's And that's the thing I mean, it, that I'm picking up in our conversation is you guys are always doing something different 
and yeah. finding out the results. Mm -hmm. So this is like good science at work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, some studies, um, you know, they, we've had projects here that like our, we called it our uh, P and K placement study. Mm -hmm. um, basically, that was a 25 year project that was used to calibrate uh, when farmers take soil tests, they'll send it off the labs and it'll um, give them, you know, how many parts per million of, of K they have, how many parts per million of uh, phosphorus they have. And basically, we were able to calibrate that into a fertilizer recommendation. Oh. So, something like that was, you know, that has to be a long term study. It, it was well, to really get that good data for I say 25 years, there might be people that have retired yeah, when that yep, thing yep, started. Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, wow. For sure. There's so much, and like you said, I mean, <laughs> we could do a podcast episode yeah. a week and not cover everything. And we've only been through the first maybe 10 acres of the farm. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, here, Over here, you can see it's a lot weedier. Um, we yeah. actually have some weed uh, uh, management demonstrations over there. Okay. Um, kind of a... You know, uh, kind of a new aspect is, is all these apps um, and forecasting and stuff. Uh, um, the study that we were, we still have some corn standing. Um, it, it's actually what we were, we just call it the spore trap study. Okay. Um, um, I'm drawing a blank on the group's complete name right now, but basically they've, the apparatus you see out on that yeah. table uh, is collecting um, particles out of the air to look to and determine, you know, what kind of uh, spores are in the air and hopefully forecast, um, you know, disease uh, incidents or severity. I'll be darned. And basically they've got an app that farmers, uh, that they're developing that farmers will be able to use to help uh, make a uh, fungicide application. Um, so somebody someday will be talking. Decisions fungicide application and somebody will yell there's an app for that yeah exactly <laughs> Man. uh we also so this is actually a long-term continuous corn field as well huh it's been in corn for uh, longer than 15 years i think and so we've also had a couple fungicide uh, uh application timing projects out there and and uh um let's see what else did we have out here um, that was these two projects here because when we get to this corner, it was corn following soybeans. So we had two different rotations in that project. Now, uh, a lot of times I notice that one year it'll be corn, next year it'll be beans, mm -hmm. and, and they keep rotating that way. And like you said, this has been this way for 15 years. Mm -hmm. Do you notice that? Uh, is there an advantage of one way over the other? Um, so, um, we have managed it as continuous corn to have that uh, that history for mm -hmm. any kind of projects that would require um, um, that type of, of treatment or, sure. or management. And um, yeah, it, I would say, you know, one of the largest pests to corn is corn rootworm and, and having a long-term continuous corn field uh, um, that, that does play a challenge in managing that field. Okay. And that's where all the uh experimenting comes in then yeah yep now i see you have a big tower off over there yeah uh that's <laughs> pretty cool uh, yeah um so we get that question a lot here and I've, i keep saying i need to come up with a really cool story for that uh -huh. tower but that's that's actually not part of our property oh it's so, not no uh someone was telling me yeah i need to to say oh that's that's how we communicate with the university and yeah uh, that's what i was guessing it's <laughs> so, like forget uh t1 lines and fiber lines every, uh, that's ever that's like one of the first questions of every new visitor is, what do you guys do with the tower <laughs> <laughs> well it's impressive yeah so um so we also have off to the right here we have uh that's actually a certified organic field and um, so generally that field is uh, in a rotation of corn, soybeans, and, and uh, like a wheat crop or an oat or a barley or something like that. Um, and so within that, the main um, component of that, they're looking at different varieties uh, for the organic, uh, say soybeans or wheat or corn hybrids that are used. And then also we are allowed to be able to do some demonstrations on how, how to, um, be organically certified and some of the management practices used for that as well in this field now certified organic and i look and we're only probably what 20 some foot from this field 
what are the rules that make, I mean, because I hear so much, uh, sometimes the, the certified organic, I just wonder if it's a gimmick sometimes yeah, yeah. because you have to be supposedly so far away where you can't get any uh, effects from mm -hmm. spraying and different things like that. And yeah. these fields seem pretty close. Yeah, uh, for sure. So there is a process to become certified organic and they have all their the rules to be able to label it as organic. And, um, you know, we do need to take that in consideration when we're treating these other fields to not drift on it or, or and to make sure that uh, our equipment is clean before we do any kind of field work in, in our certified organic field. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's it's a several year process just to become certified. And, right. and uh, um, there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, being a research farm, we have to keep track of records you know, because of that, but from like a producer standpoint, you really have to keep track of your records to, to prove that that crop is in fact organic. Well, one of the things I've noticed as a consumer, anything that's certified organic costs a lot more. Yeah, so... And why um, is that? If it's supposed to be healthier for mm -hmm. people, but yet you raise the price and make it harder for people to buy it. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, um, commercial agriculture in the sense of your tradition or your or tr i don't know if i should even say traditional agriculture but, but just kind of what you normally would think of you know it's a lot easier and more efficient when you're able to use some traded crops to help manage your pests and um and just uh to control say weeds or insects and diseases where um your certified organic, uh, we have to rely on tillage and, and you know, it's a lot more trips across the field, it's a lot more labor intensive uh, uh, to manage that crop. Gotcha. And you know, uh, it just comes back to supply and demand. There's not a lot of, of organic production to, to supply it. And, yeah. And there's a, there is a demand for it. It's what the market calls yeah, for. Exactly. Yeah. All right, where are we heading next? Yeah. Um, so we're actually coming up on another uh, cover crop project and it's also kind of looking from a systems approach and how to uh, uh, really uh, incorporate the, the cover crop into helping protect the soil, maybe um, get, uh, build that soil health. and and um, A lot of it is to the wind, like a day like this, it's, it helps keep the soil yeah. in place, correct? Well, yeah, it's an, uh, having ground cover is very important to help uh, protect it from wind and rain. Erosion. So when was this ground cover plant? So we actually used a drone to apply this seed while the soybeans were still standing. Really? Um, and some of that is just, it, it was what worked for us and, and, and what we're trying to do here from a research uh, standpoint. But, you know, a, a farmer probably would have used a plane to be able to, to apply this. But just from an accuracy standpoint and everything, we used a drone to uh, apply a mixture of triticale. I think there was some mung beans in it. and. Uh, trying to think there might even been some turnips in that mix. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. How long does it take for a drone to fly over that? And how big is this drone? Yeah, um, I think that uh, the drone had a 30 foot spread and wow. um, you know, we were able, I was able to set this whole project up on a computer. So I gave him a computer file. He plugged it in his drone. His drone knew exactly where to go and where to apply it. And so, <laughs> that's incredible. So it, it actually was fairly easy. Um, and. Um, boy, I wish I knew the answer to, you know, just kind of a general, um, how, how many acres a, a, that a drone would do in a commercial field. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm drawing a blank right now. I mean, was that farming of the future? Um, it's definitely, uh, a new component, uh, to farming for sure. Drones are, um, helping scout fields or helping apply products. And, and, you know, I, I, I guess personally feel that there is probably a big future in, in the use of drones in agriculture. So in 2023, we're actually uh, seeing a little bit of the Jetsons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, it's amazing. Now I see there's some, some activity ahead of us way out there in that field. Oh yeah, um, so the corn field that's still out there was actually our corn, our USDA corn breeders that uh, they bring in um, their their products to test them out and get yield data get field notes on um and actually he's just harvesting a little bit of bulk around what they would have came in and, and got collected yield data from nice. nice yeah um and so i guess maybe another thing to mention would be is you know we talk a lot about corn and beans and we have uh passed a lot of corn and 
and, and bean fields here, but um, just uh, just straight to the south here of us, we had a mung bean, a mung bean breeding project. Um, just kind of a new uh, bean that's used for uh, a protein source uh, for like the Impossible Burgers and those kind of things. Oh, okay. And, and so we've got a researcher that's really taking trying to make them. Just so it, so a mung bean tastes like a cow. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how they do that, but uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's one of the uses. Uh, you can see off to uh, my left here too. There's some tall grass yeah. standing. That that would actually be Miscanthus grass and. Um, um, it's kind of a or it's a bioenergy crop and and basically that project is looking at the best management practices for producing uh, uh miscanthus grass and and there wasn't uh, before that project there really wasn't a whole lot known and and you know what is the best way to to um produce miscanthus you know it's almost hypnotic watching it as the wind blows through there it's almost like watching water isn't it yeah yeah we got a nice little flower on top of there to, oh. um We've also got some hort demonstration product uh, project, or I guess hort demonstration area, and then we also have a nut tree grove over there for, that partnered with the Nut Growers Association. Wow! Uh, we've had uh, switch uh, grass biomass uh, uh, variety uh, study, and that, and that is used for fuel, isn't it? Yeah, that was one of the the reasons why that was one of the reasons why that project uh, started was you know is there different varieties and what's the yield difference and and the idea was to use it as a, a bioenergy fuel wow so in a way you know what you hear and what we see is the earth when you learn how to to work with it is very renewable mm -hmm. it's pretty incredible we're collecting solar energy yeah. with the plant <laughs> yeah <laughs> there you go the best solar collectors there are wow Hopefully people that are watching this and listening to this will let some of what we're, you're hearing soak in. It, it's really incredible. Yeah. <clears throat> I still think you should put a big ISU vertically <laughs> on all sides of that thing. <laughs> Have a big I up there and an S in the middle and U at the bottom. That'd be so cool. They'd probably do that, you know, if the university wanted to pay them, probably, right? <laughs> um, you can almost see some strips over there. We actually had a, a monarch butterfly study where we had uh, different uh, milkweed species out there that uh, uh, we were looking at uh, what species of... Uh, of milkweed did uh, monarchs like to lay their eggs on okay. uh, most. And so, I mean, that's just something that's, yeah, you come here, you probably wouldn't even think that, that we were doing, but I we didn't, are. I didn't think of it, but I'm glad you are. Yeah, we're corn, soybean production. Uh, we've got water quality projects. We've got um, pollinator habitat projects. And, and so it, uh, I mean, we've, we've got a wide variety of, of projects. And so, we, you know, if it's something that, that uh, you know, someone in the community thinks that needs to be looked at and we have the capability of doing it, um, it you know th that's what this place is for well uh the monarchs uh do you tag those as well to see how they their uh, patterns did, and how yeah. all they're doing yeah we didn't do any tagging but it was mainly just looking at you know what you know how many eggs were they laying on each plant wow you know a lot of, has been said about the monarchs over the past several years that there's less and less of them but one thing i've noticed is if you do plant a butterfly garden that have the plants that uh, they're attracted to all of a sudden there there seems to be a pretty good amount of them yeah. still yeah um i know with uh, uh we've got a strips project that um, it, it's main component is pollinator habitat and, and you definitely you can go out there and you're gonna you, you give them the habitat they'll be there so isn't that amazing so i guess the the moral to that story is to keep some habitat for yeah, them yeah. looks like he's getting her done huh yeah I, we were basically about a half a day here of running on corn and we should uh should be able to have corn wrapped up and then uh 
Um, we do have a little bit of those double crop beans that I think we'll have to wait another week or so before they'll be fit and to really wrap up harvest. So it seems like the first 90% of, of, of our crop harvest goes really fast, but that, lat, that tail end just, it, you know, we're never really done. Kind of same with planting. It seems like we're never really done until. Now has weather this fall been pretty decent for you? Yeah, we've been pretty lucky um, with, uh, um, just the length of time we had to for field operations before um, getting rained out. Although here this last week we caught some rain, but it, it was much needed rain. It was really good to see some rain and yeah. we start building up our soil moisture uh, profile as well. I say as rain starved as we've been, uh, you haven't really heard anybody complain when it rains. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just going to point out, our, this is one of our long-term studies here. It's actually a carbon sequestration study. Um, we have a continuous corn and corn soybean uh, rotation in here where we're looking at different uh, uh, tillage treatments. That's moldboard plow, deep ripping, um, no tilling, strip tilling, um, and looking at the, the effects between those treatments on uh, carbon in the soil, whether we're losing carbon or we're building carbon. And what is it at a carbon building or losing which is better um basically you know uh, we're wanting i mean ideally you're building carbon in your soil will make it a more resilient soil so i mean that would be ideal um the different treatments i i don't have uh, so that's a whole different meaning to a carbon footprint <laughs> we always hear bad things about carbon and carbon footprints but yet here this is an example where carbon is good yeah, yeah, and so uh, maybe your viewers have heard a little bit about uh, carbon credits, and so this study yeah. is kind of helping uh, come up with, you know, are we actually, uh, when, we, uh, when we're no-tilling or strip-tilling or moldboard plowing, are we losing carbon or are we building carbon in the soil? And, um, yeah. And that's a good thing if you're building it. Yep. Okay, yep. gotcha. It'd be, build, it'd be helping to build your soil resilience if you're building your organic matter. Off to the right here, we've actually planted our wheat uh, a few weeks ago for our um, wheat soybean intercropping study here. Actually, this half would be a variety, wheat variety trial that we put in, but this other half you'll see where we left some of our strips. And with our data that we got from this year's trial, we did make some changes to our treatments where we, you know, we've got some berries out here where we'll have our normal planted beans. And then we've got um, our, our, our wheat that we'll interplant beans into. Um, and then also we've got an area where we left basically a 20 inch gap right there between the, the oh, wheat yeah. plantings where we're hoping to interplant our soybeans in those gaps and maybe we'll help boost our yields that way. Just kind of one of the adjustments we made oh, based okay. off of our data. So I got a question. Out. So, and that'll be at the same time? Yeah, so we'll inter, we'll plant those beans, those interplanted beans at the same time we plant our normal beans. And basically we want to plant those um, kind of as early in the spring as possible before the wheat really takes off. So it doesn't, if you're getting in there and need to harvest the wheat or harvest the beans, mm -hmm. how do you fit in there and not damage one or the other? Yeah, so that's where we're kind of fortunate for this study. Our combine is set up where we can split those soybean rows when we're harvesting uh, the wheat, where uh, a farmer with a larger head would probably you know, harvest at an angle or something to sacrifice some of the beans but you know with a larger you know we're using a 15 foot head they're probably using 30 foot heads so, so that's really incredible i mean you're you're getting two different purposes mm -hmm. in the field at the same time yeah and so i mean it's a very uh interesting concept uh this year's data uh we, we came out with around the 70 bushel soybeans and on normal planted beans and then we came out with our interplanted beans we were only able to get about 30 to 33 bushel of the acre um, but then you're also those. getting wheat but though. we did get a wheat crop and our wheat uh yields was right around i think it was like right around 89 bushel to the acre so wow um, with the high soybean yields of the normal planting soybeans, I think when we start putting the numbers to it, we probably just that normal planted bean still yield, or, uh, profited, had more profitability, but that's why we're doing the research to try to figure out, is there a way to make that system work? Wow. Because the nice thing is, is, you know, we, we've got a green crop growing out here. We've got, um, you know, we're helping you know, keep something green in the soil longer in the season yeah versus just your normal uh corn soybean rotation once again innovation 
and it's coming from the ag industry, which seems to be where most uh, <laughs> good innovation comes from. Incredible. There's so much here, folks. Now, do you guys ever give tours? Yeah, so uh, generally, uh, uh, if someone reaches out to us for a tour, we, we, we try to accommodate the best we can as long as we're still able to get you know our timely operations done, but we gotcha. are open to the public. Well, I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen watching this, if uh, you're ever in uh, Southeast Iowa for a little bit of time and you want something to do, this is a place you need to reach out to. Now, Cody, do you have a website or do you have a Facebook page? What's the way, best yeah. way for people to get hold of you guys? Um, so we do have a Facebook page where we try to highlight uh, um, different events going on. I, I'm probably not as good at, at posting on that as I should be, but uh, um, that's just the... You're kind of busy. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, ISU Southeast Research Farm. I think would find us on Facebook. And then also uh, it, it, I, the Iowa State University Research Farms has a website that would have all of our contacts listed. Gotcha. Well, I hi highly encourage folks to to reach out to you because this is just amazing and sometimes I get into a podcast and I use the word fascinating and, and this definitely is fascinating and I'd give it you know before this this is all done this is probably going to be a three or four or five fascinating episode <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely there's always that, that's another kind of just nice thing about the job is there's I mean with the different seasons there's always something different going on and you know about every couple of weeks it's something different yeah and so now we're at the road here and this is the washington keokuk uh louisa louisa washington, washington county uh road and so across on the other side that's louisa county right yep and actually we've got another farm just down the road so we've got one of the farms here in washington county and just across the road we'd have our other farm in louisa county you know my wife and i were driving down to uh wapolo on sunday and we were down on the other end, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to be going there on Tuesday. <laughs> but obviously, I would have went to the wrong part, right? I would have still have been, I need to go down the road a ways. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, Cody, I thank you so much for being on Southeast Iowa today. And I asked you in one of the other segments if there was something I should have asked that I didn't. Uh, one more time, is there something I should have asked you that I didn't? Yeah, I think uh, without uh, creating another hour-long episode, why well, I, uh, I think we covered it pretty well for just kind of the basics of the farm here. So. Well, I sure thank you for being on today, and I'm going to put this out here so uh, I have to, you know, kind of get a public uh, promise. Will you let me come back? Yeah, you bet, and uh, hopefully we can highlight uh, in detail some more of these uh, projects that we have going on here. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much. You bet. Thanks to Cody. That was a great conversation and a great tour. And as you can see, there's so much to talk about at the Iowa State University Research Farm in Crawfordsville, Iowa. I also want to thank our sponsors, Girling Repair, Car Doctor, Griner Auto Body, B&B &B Propane and the Family of Jet Stops, McDonald Boneyard and Auto Recycling, and Hinshaw Trailer Sales. I'm your host, John Bain. Stay friendly. Southeast Iowa.